discusión de un tema que es extraordinariamente importante y que en los últimos años ha estado bajo severo eh, discusión, digamos, ¿ah? si debiera haber eh, eh, patentes, si las patentes contribuyen o no contribuyen al desarrollo económico. Eh, es un asunto extraordinariamente valioso, por ejemplo, eh, eh, a propósito de las posiciones del TPP-11, de si Chile debería sumarse o no sumarse, un tema crucial en el debate de quienes se oponen es precisamente eh, la idea de que este tratado refuerza la propiedad intelectual y las patentes como forma de desarrollo económico. Eh, y la pregunta entonces que queremos hoy día eh, discutir de alguna manera es hasta qué punto esto es cierto y cuál es el real, la real contribución de las patentes al desarrollo económico. Voy a citar, y, y después les voy a contar quién es el autor, digamos, pero quiero citar un, un párrafo que me parece muy interesante. He visto con real alarma muchos intentos recientes en algunos lugares incentivado por las autoridades para impugnar los principios que subyacen a las patentes. Estos esfuerzos de prosperar sancionarían el robo libre bajo el nombre prostituido de libre comercio y harían del hombre de ideas mucho más que ahora los criados necesitados y dependientes de los amasadores de dinero. Esto es John Stuart Mill escribiendo los principios de economía política en el año 1848. Siempre este ha sido un tema de debate. Es interesante y después voy a hacer el punto de, de, de que implícito en esto está la idea de que sin patentes no hay competencia. ¿no? Esta idea que parece contrario al sentido común de que si no hay patente, las personas que se les ocurren estos desarrollos van a quedar subeditados finalmente a personas que son, por así decirlo, rentistas. ¿Mm? O aquellos que tienen una posición ya importante en un mercado. Sin embargo, y en la misma en una perteneciendo a la misma tradición intelectual, Friedrich Hayek, en Camino a Servidumbre, sugirió que la ley de patentes ha sido una de las iniciativas que, abro comillas, ha llevado a la destrucción de la competencia en muchas esferas. 16 años más tarde, Hayek, en The Constitution of Liberty, sostuvo que, abro comillas, el conocimiento, una vez generado, queda disponible para el beneficio de todos. Es sobre la base de esta disponibilidad, hecho posible por los experimentos de algunos miembros de la sociedad, que el progreso general se hace posible. Todo aquello que obstaculiza esta divulgación de conocimiento, como las patentes, desincentiva ese progreso. La misma tradición intelectual, otra mirada. Joseph Schumpeter nunca escribió de patentes o de propiedad intelectual. En ninguna de sus obras eh, menciona patentes y propiedad intelectual. Pero es difícil pensar que su idea de creación destructiva como motor de progreso se habría podido sostener sin patentes. Este es un gran tema de discusión entre los historiadores económicos. ¿Por qué Schumpeter nunca habló de patentes y propiedad intelectual y por qué no, de alguna forma, no lo vincula a esta idea de creación destructiva? Quizás el historiador Max, eh, Mark Blau eh, que es el que más se ha acercado a entender esta paradoja. Y para él la explicación es muy simple. Era tan obvio para Schumpeter esto que no tenía mucho sentido hablar de patentes y propiedad intelectual como motor de la creación destructiva y del progreso económico. Muchas gracias entonces, profesor Heiber, por acompañarnos. Le dejo entonces el piso, por así decirlo, la sala, para que usted ponga su eh, excelente, que estoy seguro va a ser una muy buena presentación. Muchas gracias.
Muchas gracias, Dr. Baer. Este, muy buenas tardes a todos. Estoy muy honrado y eh, halagado estar aquí con ustedes para presentar este seminario. Y estoy muy agradecido al rector Bayer y al profesor Alex Galetevich por esta invitación. Les voy a pedir que me perdonen. No solo es muy difícil presentar por Zoom, pero es aún más difícil presentar por Zoom en un idioma eh, diferente que su idioma nativo. Y tengo que confesar que no soy hablante, ni hablante nativo de inglés ni de español, sino un hablante nativo de neoyorquino. <risa> Por eso he tomado la decisión de hablar en mi idioma nativo. Hará traducción simultánea al español y desafortunadamente no está aquí mi esposa para hacer traducción simultánea al inglés como ella lo hace por mis suegros. Y es que por eso a los que son... Uh, Hablantes nativos de inglés, eh, le, le pido otro disculpa. Eh, por eso voy a cambiar mi idioma nativo y eh, quisiera terminar en, en, en el castellano diciendo que estoy muy agradecido de estar con ustedes y espero que tenemos una, una, una charla entre todos nosotros uh, muy productiva. Gracias. So let's let's begin and try to understand uh, New Yorkino. <laughs> uh, we hope that we will communicate nonetheless. So, how did you become interested in intellectual property rights and uh, the relationship with development? So, um, my interest in development began when I was 13 years old. And uh, I traveled for the first time outside the United States. Uh, to Mexico. And this was in the 1970s, mind you. Um, and I could not get over the vast difference uh, in levels of living standards um, from uh, one country to the other, just crossing a border. And it prompted me to uh, begin what has now been 50 years uh, of study of first economic history and then uh, comparative politics uh, and then financial economics and most recently um, sort of what I call you know global economic development. Um, let me give you a perhaps a sense of the kind of puzzle that uh, that has motivated me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here for a second. Um, so, give me one second. People my age should not be allowed to operate technology. So, I'm going to ask your uh, forgiveness. This will take a second. Okay, here. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. So this is uh, a picture that I'm sure many of you have seen many, many times, which is uh, a, uh, a composite photo of the earth at night um, put together from multiple um, uh, uh, satellite pictures from NASA. And uh, the night lights, as they're called, um, gives us, tells us about the spatial distribution of economic activity around the planet. Um, and I don't think it's uh, any surprise as to where the intensely uh, lit up places on the planet are. Uh, it's, you know, the, uh, the United States, you can sort of see Silicon Valley over there on the, uh, on the far left in California, Western Europe, uh, Northern India, uh, the Chinese coast, uh, Japan, um, 
the uh, complex around Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, you can see Santiago is a, a little a small light uh, down there. Um, so we know what today's distribution of economic activity looks like. What, what if we could go back 500 years and see the distribution of the lights? Uh, so the thought experiment is, well, what if Martians had been circling the earth? Uh, what would they have seen? And so what, they, what the night lights are showing you here on the left, so this is the actual night lights, they're basically showing you where cities and towns are. So if you look over on the right, this is every city and town in the world with more than 20,000 people uh, on the right. So we've lit them up. And on the left, you can see the actual distribution of night lights. And you see that there is a, um, a strong degree of overlap between uh, where the cities and towns are and where the night lights are. And so with that intuition, you can now go back in time. So let me show you the world at night in 1500. Now, you're not seeing many lights. And the reason you're not seeing many lights is there are actually very few cities with more than 20,000 population in 1500. Uh, London, at that point, is the only city in Great Britain with more than 20,000 people, to give you an example. So I'm gonna magnify those cities so we can see them. So they're gonna be way larger than they really were. So the world, the distribution of economic activity around the world in 1500, this is spatial distribution, looks quite different than it does today. Western Europe, in fact, if you look at, at uh, Great Britain, um, it certainly has fewer large cities, that is fewer night lights than China and then India. Um, the Valley of uh, Mexico, Mexico City in the area, the cities around it like uh, 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 Puebla, Cholula, uh, Cuernavaca uh, are also a complex. There's one tiny dot in what is now the United States. That's the Mississippian population. So you see that what we observe in 1500 is, is not a wealthy Europe relative to Asia. Now let's go forward to 1800. I'm gonna skip 1600 and 1700 because they look pretty much like 1800. So here's 1800. This is at the dawn of the modern era, just as the industrial revolution takes off. And what I want you to notice, I'm gonna flip back and forth from 1500 to 1800. There's already been in Western Europe an economic transformation before the modern era really kicks off. So this is before railroads, before uh, steamships, um, uh, before steamboats, before Bessemer steel. Um, there's already been a big jump. So here's 1500, 1800. And if you look at, for example, India, so here's 1500, 1800, there's the growth of cities in India, but not nearly as much as it's cars in Europe. Now look at China, I'm gonna go back again. China, 1500, 1800. So there's growth, but not as much as in Europe. And you notice in 1800 in the United States, you start to get the big East Coast uh, cities. The last place I'll call your attention to is Japan, which in 1800 already is quite urban. And that's because there are already well-developed markets in Japan prior to the Meiji Restoration. So here's, just to go back, 1500, 1800. All right, let's jump on forward to 1900. Well, now you can see the rise of the Western European economies relative to everybody else and the rise of the US economy uh, relative to everybody else. Uh, you can also see the rise of South America, the South American economies. Uh, um, so I don't want to belabor this, but you'll notice if you go back to 1800, the jump from 1800 to 1900, it's the places that are popping out 
are the Midwest and East of the United States, Central and Western Europe, and Japan. And so now let's jump forward to the year 2000. Here's 2000 and you can see the, uh, the distribution. Point I simply wanna make is that one of the things that has interested me uh, as a scholar is why did things happen? Why did things come out that way and not another way? How do we explain why, why some countries or some societies at a certain period in time prospered and pulled ahead of the others, particularly Central and Western Europe, the US and Japan over the rest of the planet? Because this is a very recent phenomenon. And where I've come down on this, and then I'm gonna give the word back to uh, Alexander Galektovich, is that there was a complex of institutions and policies that emerged, and I wanna be clear about the, the, that phrase, not necessarily thought out in any long run, chosen in any planned way, but a complex of institutions and policies that emerged in those societies. Among them uh, is the, the system of patents as property rights. So the origins of the modern patent system go back to England's 1624 um, um, uh, Act on Monopolies, uh, the purpose of which was to constrain the, the king's authority to hand monopolies out to his friends. Through the eight, early 18th century, um, courts start to interpret uh, patents of invention um, as a property right that can be traded or rented. And so what emerges in English, England is a body of jurisprudence governing uh, the conditions under which an inventor can license his patent to another. That model then gets adopted by the United States in the, it's actually the only property right in the US constitution is for intellectual property. And it's one of the first acts of Congress is the Patent Act, which is modeled on England, except they drive down the, um, uh, the cost of obtaining the patent by 95%. The British at the um, 1852 uh, um, Crystal Palace exhibit are so amazed at what the Americans have done that they copy the elements of the US law. And then um, Germany, France, uh, and other European countries copy uh, the, uh, the British law and the American law. And then the German law becomes the model for Japan, although the US uh, as well uh, becomes the model for Japan. Um, and in fact, many uh, patent systems in South America. Um, in other words, countries are competing with each other. Um, and one of the, they're competing because this is a matter of, of national survival. It's either grow your economy or become a colony of somebody else and, uh, or be subordinated to somebody else. And so they begin as part of this race, copying laws that are developed first or institutions developed one place, adapting them to another. So besides the patents, when I should get rid of the screen, so here's what I mean about, um, besides patents, they also uh, begin to adopt other institutions developed elsewhere. So just one example is general incorporation, which is now spread, of course, all around the planet. And um, uh, what, what is, you know, in Spanish is a sociedad anonima, the capital variable. Um, that's actually an institution created in, in the New York legislature in 1811 for the purpose of uh, founding manufacturing companies to compete with the British. It quickly gets copied by other states in the US and then it gets copied by the British in the mid uh, 19th century and then gets copied uh, by Germany and France and eventually pretty much the entire, uh, the entire planet. 
So there are the other, uh, another institution which I'll point to uh, here is the research university. That is like the University of Adolfo Ibanez uh, is a German invention. Uh, it's like a Prussian invention more precisely, um, which then uh, spreads around the planet. So Stanford University is founded on the model of a, the Prussian research university. Uh, and um, then many other universities around the planet also founded on that model, as opposed to the old British model of, of uh, uh, educating gentlemen uh, for the clergy uh, and the law. Uh, what I want to get across here is that there is a bunch of institutions that emerge that reinforce each other. They're mutually dependent and mutually reinforcing. No single one of them alone is sufficient to push forward economic development, but all of them ultimately are, each one is a necessary condition. And amongst those necessary conditions, as countries discover quite on their own, is a patent system, uh, which is why the US improvement over the British system in the 19th century comes to be the dominant way that intellectual property rights are traded in a market in order to push forward growth. And now let me give the, the word back to uh, Alex. So, so let me ask you then, I mean, in the, so it seems that intellectual property rights are enmeshed in a web of other, uh, of other property rights and institutions. What do exactly patents do then? And why are they important? So I was, I was particularly pleased uh, to hear uh, Rector Bayer's uh, uh, discussion at the beginning uh, about the battle over patents in the, uh, in the 19th century. Um, and um, one of the uh, uh, people he pointed to, um, uh, John Stuart Mill made the point that without patents, uh, there isn't growth. And that seems contradictory because what Mill is saying is that, is that patents are preventing monopolies. Well, how can it be that something that grants, that is often claimed to grant a monopoly is in fact encouraging competition? Um, what patents do is actually not grant monopolies. They create a property right to an idea or process that did not exist before. If you actually had, if you actually invented something that nobody else could reverse engineer and for which there were no substitutes, you would not take out a patent on it at all. You'd hold it as a trade secret and you'd maintain a monopoly until somebody came up with a substitute. The classic example of this is Coca-Cola, which is not patented. The can may be patented, but not the, the uh, formula for Coca-Cola. So what patents are really doing um, is they're creating a property right so that someone who specializes, a firm or individual that specializes in invention can appropriate the returns uh, to that investment by licensing the technology to another firm that specializes in production. This is the, it is that uh, ability to capture the patent system's ability to allow people to capture, uh, gain some specialization that pushes forward innovation. Um, I'll, I'll give you two examples of this. I bet that everybody in the audience today has a smartphone. It does not matter whose name, which company's brand name is on your phone. Almost all of the patents 
that may be allowing you, in fact, to watch this seminar on that phone are not owned by the companies whose names are on your phone. That's true, incidentally, as well, for the, if you're watching this on a tablet or a computer. There are specialized firms that develop the technologies and that then license their patents. And so what patents are basically doing is allowing for gains in specialization. And they do that by creating something that's tradable um, rather than creating a monopoly. So, sorry. So about so why um, why is specialization so important in the innovation process, and how do patents help that? Okay. So, um, in order, so let's think about first. Let's start with the, what do we mean by innovation? And I, I would define it as follows: it is the ability to see a demand curve for something that doesn't exist yet. And then the ability to bring together all of the components necessary to take that idea, to turn it into a, uh, a product, to market the product, finance its development, um, invent the things, the parts that have to be invented combine the, the technologies that already exist in novel ways, or it's the, the creative act of seeing a product that already exists and figuring out, oh, I can produce this more inexpensively by combining uh, technologies uh, differently than they already are. What this process does is it generates Ricardian rents. Um, that is, it allows a firm to earn more dollars or uh, pesos in revenue per, ex per dollar expended than its competitors. So the classic example of this is the iPhone. Apple has about a 40% gross margin. There's almost no company on the planet with that kind of gross margin. And it comes from the fact that they charge about three times more for an iPhone but their production costs are only about twice as high as their competitors. And it's because consumers value the iPhone higher than they value the products of competitors. And so innovation requires the ability not just to invent the, the patents that allow the iPhone to stream my voice and image to you, but all of, but be able to put together, finance, produce, and market an integrated product that requires specialization. You, it's you know, one, there have been examples where firms vertically integrate all the way back and you control everything. That has a disadvantage, however, because now you have to internalize all of the costs um, across every domain. And so if there is a secret, if we go back you know, to those images of the world at night, and you see the US sort of exploding in the 19th century, what you're basically seeing, you know, where all these little cities, these are all, lo lo these are all localities of specialized production. So here's something you may not know. In the 19th century, the late 19th century, the richest city in the United States is Cleveland. And it's wealthy because it's the center for American production of electrical machinery. And if you look at the structure of Cleveland's industry as uh, my colleague Naomi Lamoureux has done, it looks a lot like Silicon Valley today. Lots of small specialized firms, each one doing one thing very, very, very well and each simultaneously competing with the others and cooperating with them. And so that's, it's that um, sort of ecology of lots of small firms 
who compete sometimes and cooperate at others that allow specialization without it, it would be necessary for a firm, and there have been firms like this in the past, that integrate backwards into everything. But the evidence suggests that you, once you do that with a firm, except under some extraordinary, unusual circumstances that we could talk about, um, that you become very inefficient, that the bureaucracies inside the firms, um, uh, you know, let's go so back, back to something that uh, uh, Harold Bayer was mentioning, that you know, you, it's very hard to get creative destruction when what you have are these immense bureaucracies inside these immense firms uh, that are more interested in holding on to their privileges and rents than they are in competing with anybody. So, um, so that's what, what, you know, in my view, what's driving development. But, but without a system of property rights that make it possible to trade in intellectual property, but also make it possible to trade in financial property, and also allow for the sort of seamless contracting across firms, it is very hard to get this kind of specialization. So why, I mean, uh, your, vi your vision about patents, which is uh, the eight special, they are a property right, the eight specialization, and they seldom create a monopoly, uh, is not what we usually hear about patents. Patents, uh, and there is a movement, a, a fairly large movement uh, in the US and probably Europe and, and, and more, that claims or argues that patents essentially what they do is they prevent the diffusion of knowledge. Hayek's uh, quote by Rector Bayer uh, was is, is one of one one instance of that of that view. Um, what what does this movement say? Claim what is what and and, and how does this uh, uh, originate? What you call the battle over patents. And, and, and what is this battle about? So um, the total amount of surplus generated by any product is bounded by the demand curve. Any producer along the production chain is battling over the portion of producer surplus bounded by that demand curve. That means in a system characterized by lots of specialized firms, all of the firms up and down the production chain are going to fight over the surplus. They are going to fight with every arrow in their quiver. They may fight on the basis of um, the, uh, the charm of their salespeople. They may fight on the basis of the quality of their product. Um, but they will also use law and, and regulation to fight with each other. As a general principle, the firms at the end of a production chain, those who are earning the, uh, the revenues from consumers want to hold onto as much of the surplus generated by that product as they can. And they will therefore usually fight for a weak patent system. The firms further up the production chain, uh, especially those that specialize in technology production, like the ones that, you know, there's about, there's probably about a hundred firms that own the various technologies inside your smartphones. Some of them come together in pools and there's around essentially 30 entities that uh, most of which you guys have never heard of. <laughs> um, um, they're gonna fight for their share of the surplus. And they're also going to use the courts and law and policymakers to get to increase their share. What we've seen in the last 20 years in the United States and in Europe is that the large firms at the end of the production chain 
have done a very, very good job lobbying the general public and lobbying policymakers, lobbying regulators. Uh, in the case of the Obama administration, lobbying the White House directly for a weakened patent system simply because it was in their financial interest to do so. Um, they then, you know, there's, whenever there's a demand for a product, in this case, demand for um, arguments for a weakened patent system, producers will emerge. Uh, and uh, academic producers of that, of that view emerged to meet the demand. So what, what would you say, I mean, uh, what does history have to say about this battle of the patents? How does it play out and how, what would you think would be the, will be the outcomes of the current battle over patents in view of this uh, economic history? Well, there's the economic history of the US and then there's the economic history of other, other places. So let me say a word about the US. The same battle, that's going on today took place in the 19th century in the United States. Um, it was basically the railroads against the uh, producers of railroad cars, railroad brakes, uh, locomotives and the like. The railroad owners complained, how can it be that this person, this George Westinghouse then invented this brake? How can it be that he gets so much money for his brake when he doesn't run a railroad. And so in fact, there was a, the same terms that get thrown around today about uh, pat, they used slightly different terms. So today we talk about patent trolls in the 19th century, they talked about patent sharks. Ultimately, what happened in, in the US um, is that that attack on patenting failed uh, in the late 19th century. And the US became a very strong protector of patent rights. Um, right now we're in a phase of attack on patent rights. Um, my own sense is like in the 19th century, it will reverse and it will reverse for a very good reason, which is failure to reverse, slows the rate of growth of innovation and innovation isn't just about the size of GDP. Innovation is also about what there is avail what surplus is available for the state to combat its perceived enemies. So in the competition between China and the United States, that is going to create pressure in the United States for a stronger patent system because part of the rivalry between the US and China um, is, is, you know, is ultimately sort of military and political and an economy that produces more surplus is going to decide how that ends. And here I'll just, I'll, I'll say one word about, about China in this regard. So if you went back to the 11th century, China was well ahead of the rest of the world in the production of what at that time would have been considered the high technology products. China invents movable type ahead of the West by five centuries. It invents gunpowder and the cannon and the first firearms. One of the things, and we can pursue this if, the, if you, you are all interested, one of the things that does not happen, however, in China, uh, until very, very recently and then incompletely, is a patent system. And so while there are inventors uh, in, uh, in 11th century China, um, and many marvelous inventions, including another one being water clocks. Um, what doesn't come into existence is a market for invention because it, the political economy of China is not based on the idea of markets for anything. 
Rather, there's a very centralized political system which sits on top of a commercial economy and the political system views its role as maintaining social order in an heavily agrarian society. And so that for centuries on end, and it's a recurring theme in Chinese history, blocks the emergence of um, what not just property rights and patents, but property rights and financial uh, instruments, for example, uh, which get killed off in, this, in the uh, early 17th century in China. So I could spend more time talking about this, but all of these different um, sort of institutions that emerge in Europe and in the US that allow for specialization, uh, the sort of central authority, centralizing authorities in China, uh, because they can, and because it would threaten their dominance, choke them off, and don't realize until the 19th century that this has allowed them to fall behind. So, so you what, what you mentioned is that in the end, intellectual property is enmeshed with politics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that in the end, what will drive the current uh, battle over patents is essentially a geopolitical situation. Yes. In fact, I would go even further. I would say that it's, so I know that many of you from the, are from the Escuela de Gobierno. The patent system, the financial system um, um, are both provinces of politics and should be studied in schools of government and political science. And uh, speaking as a political scientist, um, I'm amazed how we have left $20 bills sitting on the sidewalk by not making the study of uh, intellectual property, um, finance and uh, other innovation related institutions part of the study of government, because fundamentally this is political. And I'll go even further, it, you know, it's, it is, I would argue that it is impossible to take the politics out of anything where economic surplus is at stake. Human beings are going to find ways to compete over surplus. We're really inventive <laughs> and uh, we will compete using every strategy we can think of. And politics, of course, is one of the most readily available. So let me, let me push you to, to a, a somewhat different direction. You mentioned that uh, what drives innovation in the end is uh, appropriation of surplus. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, uh, typically it has been argued that imperfect competition and monopoly is necessary to create the rents. Now, you may, how can, can you have rents if you don't have monopolies? Uh, you can create rents by producing something. Um, you, can, you can create rents um, by producing something more efficiently than your competitors or better um, than your competitors um, with... Um, that is that, so think of it this, here's a way to th sort of think about this. Um, the, the iPhone, um, Apple is not a monopoly. Apple's probably got about a 30% uh, market share uh, by value around the world. So the gross margins of Apple cannot be the product um, cannot be the product of, um, a, uh, of market power. They're the product of Ricardian rents, the ability to produce, um, to produce a product that consumers value more highly than, other, than those of their competitors. And so the source of rent, you know, to go back to something that Rector Bayer was saying, the source of rent comes from competition it is an outcome of creative destruction. It's not the, the, um, not the existence of a monopoly. If one were to look at the 
uh, high return firms around the world, the most innovative firms around the world, one would be hard pressed to find many that met the, the definition, the textbook definition of a monopoly, which is to constrain output in order to raise price. Um, so the, uh, the, the, this idea that there is no, no innovation without monopoly is I'm afraid um, uh, easy to understand, but I believe flawed. I see. Let me go to some questions for our audience. There's a question that's, uh, which is as follows. Uh, what can a small open economy like Chile do to become more innovative? And what is the role of patents and intellectual property in this strategy? One of the advantages uh, of the current world system is that a firm in Chile can patent its inventions everywhere in the world. Uh, in the US and China and Japan, and in fact, those law firms specialize in doing this. That means that a Chilean uh, firm can um, use the patent system of other countries to develop the firm, and in fact, use the patent system of other countries to protect itself from infringement uh, by using, for example, the, um, uh, the International Trade Commission of the United States. Uh, it means that small countries can avail themselves of the ability to specialize uh, in order to, to earn uh, Ricardian rents. The classic example of this is uh, the uh, Swedish economy. So if you think about the, you know, the big successful Swedish firms, Volvo, Husqvarna, ABB, um, and the like, what do they have an advantage in? And the, advan the advantage they have is they're very intellectual property intense. Um, so the, um, they, they maintain their world, their, their share of the world market and they earn a premium price um, because they're able to take advantage, of, they're able to tap into the entire world market and they're able to protect their intellectual property by availing themselves of courts around the world to prevent infringement, that is people appropriating their intellectual property without licensing it. So I, I would think, you know, a classic example that, uh, uh, of this is, is, is Sweden. Incidentally, a very different view of what the Swedish economy is from uh, at least what many of my, uh, my students and colleagues in the United States seem to think the Swedish economy is. So essentially intellectual property uh, um, under other things has uh, enabled the Swedish economy to specialize in and sell in the world market. Yes. Well, Ericsson is one of the key developers of technology in, in, in phones. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Nokia's, of course. Yeah, I mean, in fact, within your smartphone, I bet nobody has a smartphone or almost nobody has a smartphone with the brand name Ericsson on it. But I can guarantee you that there is Ericsson patented technology in your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ericsson earns, if memory serves, about a billion dollars a year just from the licensing fees on those standard essential patents that are in virtually all smartphones. Mm -hmm. There is another question here. Um, you put a lot of stress on, on the historical evidence about how patents uh, were pivotal during the Industrial Revolution in Britain and the US. But uh, why is this, is this research relevant today, given that the economies are seemingly far more complex than they used to be at, at those times? I put a lot of emphasis, emphasis on it because uh, there's um, one, there are really two laboratories. Well, there's three laboratories we have as, as social scientists for testing an hypothesis. Uh, this is in fact was a point made by Schumpeter in, uh, in the 1930s. The first is economic history. The second is econometrics. 
Uh, and though Schumpeter didn't mention it, the third is a lab. Well, it'd be very hard to develop uh, a lab experiment in which we had two economies, one without intellectual property and one with, and then wait and see what happens. So RCTs are very valuable, but they're, they're, they don't lend themselves to this kind of large scale, very long term um, uh, analysis. We can't wait around a hundred years and see what happens. There is statistical evidence also favoring the hypothesis that patents plus other institutions that make patents enforceable, that is quality of rule of law, have a positive effect on economic growth. And those of you who've read the short article that uh, was circulated on patents in the wealth of nations, uh, those are referenced in the bibliography. There is, however, a problem of identification which is why economic history is so valuable. We don't know, if you think about the econometric problem, you have a, a particular innovation, you have a particular change in the law, and then you have a particular set of innovations or inventions, but you don't know the lag length between the time of a particular invention, its complementary inventions, and then the commercialization of that product. So to specify a proper model, you would need to know what, what the nature of the distributed lag is and how long the lag is. If you guys are staying with me, I'll give you an example of this. The laser is invented in the late 1950s. No one's really sure what it's going to do. It's not until the 1990s, that is it's over 30 years later, that lasers start to get applied in all kinds of applications like um, um, fiber optic cables, laser pointers, um, CD players, uh, laser guided surgery, laser cutting of fabrics and uh, metals. Um, so the, the, the applications of the laser um, take a very long time. So if you were gonna write down a properly specify a model about the impact of the laser on uh, uh, the shock of the laser on world economic activity, you would have to know what the lag length was. Well, we don't know. And so for that reason, researchers, while they look at the, um, the available time series and cross-sectional evidence, and there's a lot of people doing this work, as I say, referenced in Patents in the Wealth of Nations, um, they also rely on uh, economic history. So these, these should be understood as complements to each other, not substitutes for each other. And as my advisor used to say, whenever the econometric evidence and the historical evidence lead you to the same material conclusion, well, then maybe you really have something. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. Uh, what about the arguments? Uh, what about the arguments that uh, intellectual property and, in particular, patents hurt uh, emerging, developing, and emerging economies because they cannot use or produce what the stock of knowledge allows? This this is very much related for for the debate about uh, about drugs, right? That uh, developing countries are hurt by patents because they can't use the drugs that are available in the world. What so is there, your view about that? Well, there's a body of work, and I'm blanking on the name of the uh, um, of the person. He's at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, who's written a bunch of papers around this? Um, and one of the, so let's be very, very clear first off. When a firm files a patent, it must include a description of the product being patented such that when the patent expires, it could be copied by any firm in the world. That means the knowledge, a lot, not all of the knowledge, but a lot of the knowledge is actually in the patent. And there are in fact countries around the world that have made a business out of knocking off or creating generics 
of patented products, especially pharmaceuticals. It's not the patent on advanced pharmaceuticals that appears to matter, however. The patent's a necessary input, but not sufficient because there's a lot of tacit knowledge that's also required in order to produce the product successfully. So for example, in the recent coronavirus COVID vaccines, where there was a, a, a push to weaken, um, uh, to, to weaken the patent rights of uh, both European and American firms, the claim was, well, we will have, if, if the patents are free, then those products will get produced around the world more quickly. Uh, the evidence doesn't favor that because if you don't take a license to the patent, there's no way to get the tacit knowledge that's also necessary in order to successfully produce a product that works. So it's not whether there's a patent or not. And in fact, uh, what, what I would advance the hypothesis that if patent rights were weakened in order to in, promulgate the diffusion of medical technologies, firms would simply do a lot less patenting and would rely far more on trade secrets. So there would be even less um, knowledge in the public domain than there is already. The, the other outcome that could happen is simply less innovation in those sectors. So the, the, the point I wanna make here is that, is that while it's often argued that the, intellectual, the, the international intellectual property system is the barrier to development. Um, I would argue the contrary, but that does not mean that if the Central African Republic tomorrow adopted the US patent system, it would develop. What it means is that you, all, the whole suite of institutions and laws that allow the patent system to operate as a market would have to be there as well. I see. Um, Are you an example of this in history for, because uh, we have a long run outcome is Japan. So um, Japan had something approximating a market economy circa, circa 1800. Japan gets confronted by uh, Western imperialism in the 1850s, when a US fleet arrives and tells the Japanese, you're going to open up uh, or we're going to open fire on you. Uh, that is, you're going to open up the foreign trade. The response of the Japanese is to defensively modernize. Uh, what we call the Meiji Restoration is actually a revolution. So it restores the emperor to power, but it restores him with a bicameral legislature and a commercial code based on the German uh, commercial code and the German parliamentary model. And then the Japanese go around copying the British banking system, they send emissaries to, to England to study the banking system. So they copy the British banking system. They copy the US patent system. They're quite conscious of it. They copy uh, German corporate law. They copy um, the German model of um, a, um, uh, a centralized command um, for the army and, uh, and hire Prussian uh, advisors. They copy the British Navy. Uh, so they, they set out to create all of these, the whole suite of complementary institutions. And it works. Uh, and Japan become, emerges as a, a, a world power in the second half of the latter decades of the 19th century and then through the 20th. Is, is there a role for patents in, in technology diffuse, diffusion? I mean, uh, if, if patents uh, 
favor specialization mm -hmm. uh, is it does it help to diffuse technology as well and especially in developing countries what's the evidence about that so the evidence again there's um there are quite a number of papers showing that countries that have more more, uh, more liberal patenting systems, that is where it's easier to uh, obtain and then protect the patents, have faster technology diffusion than countries that don't. And the reason is that it creates an incentive for foreign firms to build production facilities in those countries. And once you have a production facility, now there's an awful lot of learning in fact, that must take place by uh, uh, workers in the uh, in the country in order to learn how to operate that firm. And so the uh, the evidence is pretty strong that technology diffuses more quickly. Uh, the more foreign investment uh, a firm a country gets, and the more, but in order to get foreign investment, you have to be willing to enforce the property rights of the foreign, com foreign company, that is its intellectual property rights, or want to invest in the first place. So it won't, for example, uh, build a, um, uh, a, a fab to produce, let, let's say, uh, uh, medicines, if it's worried that the, uh, its rights, its patent rights will be uh, immediately abrogated. So essentially, uh, patents and technology transfer are complements. Oh, absolutely. I see, I see. Um, so I think we are, uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, what else would you, would you uh, tell to a middle income economy like Chile about intellectual property rights? And, and uh, what the role or what we should be thinking about intellectual property rights. I think, you know, if I were to step back uh, from intellectual property rights um, and to think about the countries that have emerged as prosperous over the last two centuries, what they had in common was laws, legal systems and policies that allowed individuals and firms to appropriate returns from their investments. Those investments could be physical, they could be in property of various kinds like financial property or intellectual property, but they could also be investments in human capital. And that ultimately economic development isn't about things, it's about people. It's the ability to combine people with complementary skill sets, that is with complementary forms of human capital who have an incentive to cooperate, that is to not free ride on each other uh, because there's a legal system that punishes free riding and therefore allows individuals to appropriate the returns to their human capital investments or to their investments in some form of non-human capital, a patent, a copyright, a factory, a farm, et cetera. And so the, there's no one single thing. You know, there's a, there was a long period after the, the Second World War where economists went looking for the one thing, the one thing that uh, allowed uh, Western economies to outgrow others. And the, the result they finally came to was they couldn't find the one thing. Rather, there was a sweet, you know, this goes back to the work of Kuznets and Kuznets' students like Fogel uh, and Gallman and Engerman and others and, uh, and Davis. They could never find the one thing. There was a suite of things. But what they all had in common was the ability of people to pursue their self-interest. And so from the point of view of a, a, a small open economy, this is actually right now a very big opportunity because the changes in the dramatic fall in the cost of, trans, of transport and dramatic fall in the cost of information, communication uh, is, is so fast 
that it's made markets worldwide rather than national. And that means a political economy that is quite consciously aimed at allowing individuals and firms to appropriate returns to their invention and to take advantage of the big international economy can generate tremendous amounts of surplus. And again, I would point to Sweden as a, as a quintessential example of this. Um, Sweden is not rich because Sweden has a lot of trees. Sweden is rich because Sweden has a bunch of firms that export to an international market and that do so because they defend their intellectual property. They enforce their intellectual property in Sweden and they enforce it around the world and they become vendors to other firms around the world. So Ericsson is a, is a kind of quintessential example of this. Okay, we're getting to the end. Uh, let me thank you for a fascinating conversation. And uh, I hope that uh, we will meet again uh, and we will have you here in Chile once uh, uh, COVID uh, allows us to return to normal life. Um, the rest, uh, we will be back in October with, uh, with another uh, colloquium on intellectual property. And uh, we, will, we will make this a regular series. So please stay tuned and, and I hope to have you again uh, here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, for being with us. It was my, my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias,